We should be in Canada now. I can't live here any longer not knowing what will happen tomorrow. You were right, Bess. We need to go. They've closed the borders. Martial law, they want a war with Canada. There has got to be a way to get out. We have to get out. Now. Welcome, everyone, to the sixth and final episode of the official Plot Against America podcast from HBO. My name is Peter Sagal. You know me, perhaps, from NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. For the sixth and final time, it is my privilege to sit again with the creator and executive producer of The Plot Against America, David Simon. Hey, David. Hey, thanks for having me back. Again, please go and watch not just the episode, the whole series, because we're going to be talking about a lot of things that played out throughout the six hours of TV that you hopefully have seen by now. Let's get into where we are when this episode starts. The rioting that we had seen acted out, much to Herman's dismay, at the end of last episode is now spread. There's rioting all over the country now, right? Wherever Walter Winchell goes. <laughs> yeah. So Winchell has become not so much the symbol of the resistance or the anti-Lindbergh forces, but the target of pro-Lindbergh rage. They come to him wherever he is, and these riots play out like a series of crystal knocks where they take the provocation of Winchell daring to denounce the president to attack Jewish businesses, burn them, as happened in Germany. Yeah. Prior to this, as scary as things got, it seemed still sane. Now we're moving into a very different kind of country. The last we saw of Herman, he's beaten. He is finally, it seems, come to see what is really going on and how limited his options are. And Herman and Bess, his wife, have a conversation early in this episode. Can't believe how fast it's spread to other cities. And the hate is there. It's like dry leaves waiting on a spark. Well, like it or not, Lindbergh is teaching us what it means to be Jews. We only think we're Americans. No. They think we only think we're Americans. They think with one more push, one more shove, they will break. And let them dump us in Kentucky or wherever. And they call us others. They're the others. Lindbergh is the other. A man is unfit. He should not be the president. It's as simple as that. His tone is so different than it was when he was in his house, in his living room, holding forth, no, they're not going to be able to do this to himself. He seems to have come to a place of resignation that this is what is happening and there's maybe nothing he can do about it. It's the voice of a man who is still willing to have the fight, but now has the fundamental sense that he may lose. Yeah. He's not yet ready to give up on the idea of who he is and where he has to stand to make the fight. But yeah, you're hearing the resignation of somebody who thinks I'm having a fight I, I may not win. In fact, I think I may not win it. One of the things that Herman says to Bess in that conversation is he is unfit, which is a word we have heard a lot in our recent political discourse. Was that an intentional reference or echo of that? I'm afraid it was. You know, it's funny to hear him say that as it is to hear people now say it because when you say something like he is unfit, he's unqualified, he does not deserve to be president, whatever you might be saying, you're implying the existence of someone who can enforce that. And there isn't anybody. Right. I mean, Lindbergh may be unfit to be president. He's president. What are you going to do about it? Well, naively, you could say we were a nation of laws and that at those moments where the oath of office is violated, another branch of government has the um, capacity to determine that and to remedy it or not. Yes. In real life, anybody who premised their hopes on the idea that the government would do its job to rectify a very overt violation of law and of the president's oath has to be disappointed. Yeah. Things are bad when the episode begins. They become even worse when Winchell is killed, which is something that Bess hears about at her job, which she immediately quits. Did you make a specific decision not to stage that assassination? I didn't know who we had that would have point of view. We've been rigorous about giving point of view only to six people throughout the piece. A member of the nuclear Levin family is there to witness it. 
or Evelyn is there to witness it, or Alvin is there to witness it. Those are the six points of view. Even Bengelsdorf doesn't have point of view. If you think about it, Evelyn's in the room. So anything else that happens off screen has to happen off screen. By and large, the power of the piece is played out in the Levin family living room. Yeah. Or on their street or on Summit Avenue. And we tried to stay true to that for the most part. Speaking of their house on Summit Avenue, this is something that I found lovely in the book and eventually as well in the TV show. The arrival of the Kokotso family in the basement apartment that used mm-hmm. to belong to the Wishnows. There's this initial moment of feeling of displacement or having something of the Jews taken from them and given to others. There's that chilling moment where Mr. Kokotso takes down the mezuzah and, mm-hmm. and hands it to He's Philip. He's basically saying, you're Jewish. No, yeah. this is yours. I'm right. giving it back. And there are a couple things, though, about that character. First of all, we think of Italian-Americans as being just another flavor of white people today, but they also had their immigration experience. They also were aliens yeah. in this land. Yeah. And that leads to one of the more moving things is when Mr. Kokotso comes upstairs later in the episode to give... A cake and a gun. For you. Uh, it, it's very nice of you, Mr. Kakuza, but I, I, I really don't know how to shoot. But you pull the trig. Hey, you, you just pull the trig. <laughs> We've been talking a lot in the course of this podcast about the similarity of the immigration experience and that sort of solidarity. The Irish, the Italians, the Jews were three of the essential pillars of New Deal politics. We will take the new Americans and we will deliver them to an ethnic coalition that will deliver the votes of the working class for the working class. And it worked for a long time. It worked for much of the 20th century. And it only began to fall apart, sadly, when that coalition was asked to include people of color. That was the moment where it was a bridge too far for some in the coalition to extend the same political equalities. At that moment, the commonalities were outweighed by the apparent differences that people perceived. And so the camaraderie that he depicts between the Kukuzas and the Levins is a sad artifact in some ways of a different America. Yeah. There are a lot of different things that happen in this episode as befits the climax of a series, but let's just follow each thread individually. Sure. Winchell is shot and killed in Louisville, which is in eastern Kentucky, which immediately makes Bess worry about the Wishnows. She calls and discovers Selden home alone. In the book, the most moving and powerful scenes, I thought, were Bess on the phone with Selden, mothering him from a distance. And it came across beautifully. Selden, that's enough of that. You're making yourself hysterical. Of course your mother is alive. She, she, she's just late coming home. But if she were alive, she would call. She always Selden, calls. please calm down. Please, 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 dear, please stop crying. It's Bess Levin's finest hour in the book. It's her great journey. It's what she's asked to do. She's completely terrorized. You know, why is there gunfire on Summit Avenue? But she's trying and succeeding and focusing on this terrified child. And it's all one long shot as you come closer and closer and closer down the hall. It was a great shot by Tommy. Then the rescue mission is born because they have to go get Selden. This is going to be Herman's war. Alvin had his war. Bess has had her great moment of heroism on the phone. Herman's about to undertake a sort of a soldier's story of his own, and his son's going to witness it. And the journey back and forth across the country at this time, which occurs throughout the episode, it's like one of those refugee stories. You know, how do we get from the shtetl to America, except it's in America, Mm -hmm. and the terrors they come across are all domestic. And there's a lot that happens just looking at Herman's face as he sees what he sees. There's that episode, I think it's on their way back, where they drive slowly through a town where a Jewish-owned store is being burned while the firemen, I think, are just standing there watching. Mm -hmm. We actually have Dina Goldman, the production designer for episodes four and onward, talking about that particular scene. This was particularly scary because we built the facade of this general store in front of a person's house. It's, it's kind of like a saloon, sort of old-timey Hollywood thing where you have most of the facade and then you trick it out with super special effects so that it doesn't actually burn the entire street down. But, you know, even when that happens, it still, like, kicks up the intensity of a bunch of notches to make sure that everybody's safe. 
That was actually the last thing you shot, right, in the whole production? Yeah, we finished on that street after the controlled burn, after the fire, at about 4.30 in the morning. Maybe that has something to do with how exhausted Herman seems at that point. (laughs) Yeah, he was the last actor standing. Morgan was the last actor standing. There's something so terrifying about all those sequences because there's a thing that's come up once or twice throughout the series where people recognize Herman as a Jew. The, the, even the first episode, hey, Houdin, the Germans shout. Mm-hmm. Or when the refugees are going to Canada and they see him and they pull over and they say, Lonsman, you're a Jew. Yes, of course. And knowing that he has been identified as a Jew as he travels through this transformed landscape, knowing that at any time this Klansman who stares him down could mm-hmm. decide he's another Jew to beat or kill. It's absolutely terrifying. And on top of that, knowing there's nothing he can do, there's nobody he can call. The firemen there aren't going to leap to his rescue. Even in a benign moment in the show when they reach the Malwini's farm to pick up Selden and you meet Mr. Malwini, who turns out is a nice man, even then the difference between them. That's something that Roth did so beautifully in the book, which is he had an absolute awareness that most people are going to be good. And if left to their own devices, they're going to be honorable. And so there are key moments in the book where when you expect the worst out of people, the better angels of American nature reveal themselves. Roth was trying to say something about who we are if we're not incapacitated by our fears and our resentments, uh, who we're capable of being as a people. It's interesting. The last thing we saw of Herman in the last episode, he got beaten to a pulp by a mob. He was defeated. And it's amazing to me that he still travels across America on fire. It's a remarkable act of courage to bring his son, no less. In that sense, Bess prevailed upon him. Bess, having come to the correct conclusion that Selden and his mother were out in Kentucky because of the complicity of their youngest son. She's the one who impresses upon him that Selden is now their absolute responsibility. But yes, he willingly takes on the hero's journey, which is, you know, I found that exhilarating the book, that the man who yells at his radio for most of the book, when the chips are down, he does what has to be done. I should say, there's always a little line that doesn't, it's not that important, but it's the one that you just, you're so glad it exists. There's a moment when Herman and Sandy make it back in Jersey. Yeah. And they're having a sandwich outside of a, a roadside stop. Yeah. The sandwich is, what is it, bologna on white bologna bread? Bologna on white bread with, with mayonnaise. mayonnaise. Which for non-Jews in the audience is sort of the quintessential goyish of food. Shanda. It's, it's a, a shanda. shanda. I remember, I, like a lot of kids my generation, I used to sneak over to non-Jewish friends' houses and have Wonder Bread with Oscar Mayer bologna. And Hellman's mayonnaise. Oh my God. It was, yeah. it was almost literally the forbidden fruit. So uh, at some point, they bite into this, the sandwiches that have been made for them at this roadside place in you know, rural Jersey, seldom sleeping in the car. They've come through this hellacious odyssey. And uh, Sandy says, bologna and white bread with mayonnaise. And Herman looks at him and says, I'll be goddamned. They're trying to kill us. <laughs> okay, origin of the line. My father, at age 57, uh, was the PR director for B'nai B'rith, a Jewish service organization in Washington. At work one day, his building was taken over, and my father was taken hostage. He was identified. He took great umbrage at this as one of the old men. He was 57. Yeah. You know, come on. You know, yeah, he's please. younger than I am now. But um, they untied his hands so he could feed the other hostages because yeah. they, were, they were there for like two days. And at one point, he's feeding one of his longtime best friends, another B'nai B'rith, Nick, you know, named Sid Kloster, and He's feeding him, and it's sandwiches sent over by the Hilton, and it's white bread, bread bologna, bologna, mayonnaise. And Sid looks at him and says, mayonnaise on white bread? And my dad looks at him and says, Sid, I think they're trying to kill us. <laughs> and literally, there are guys standing over him with, like, scimitars and guns. <laughs> it, it, like, the line was one of the funniest things my dad ever said. He and Sid, like, you know, they couldn't stop laughing for a moment. It was yeah. like, you know, let's get a grip. we got to go back to being hostages. I finally managed to get that there line you go. somewhere. In a, I, I couldn't be more proud. Well, you should be. I'm just trying to imagine, how long after that event did your father tell you that story? Did he come home and say, let me tell you? My father, when he was released as a hostage, within a couple hours, he sat down at his typewriter in the basement and he typed a long op-ed piece for the New York Times in which that line was related. It's yeah, it's a magnificent work of journalism, actually. It's something I'm very proud to have on my wall. For somebody who wants to look it up, what was your father's name? Bernard Simon. All right. There's another moment of a glimmer of brightness, which is Winchell's funeral. It's a multicultural crowd. It's not just Jews. It's a lot of people who have a lot to lose. It's the New Deal coalition basically standing in the street. It is demonstrable that there's an America that is very tired of this 
savage politics of exclusion and race baiting and xenophobia and fear mongering, they want to return to the standards of behavior that they've come to feel they're entitled to as citizens. And so, yeah, the, the chance of where is Lindbergh? And really what they're asking is, where is the bully pulpit? Where is the president to say what's right and what's wrong? And to say it in terms that don't have anything to do with his political advantage. That's the minimum we have to ask of our presidents. So we'll leave the Levins. They made it back. There's still violence. It's lapping in the edges of the world. But let's move over for the moment to the Bengelsdorf family. Bengelsdorf is with the first lady concerned but he can't seem to get her to do anything. Did he really think that his relationship with the First Lady was going to save anybody at this point or make any difference? I think he is still committed to the idea that the president can be tone deaf, he can be a little bit oblique, his timing may be off, but that if you can just prevail upon him to say the right thing, he is not an anti-Semite. He's not someone who is willing to use fear to his political advantage. He's not a political opportunist when it comes to America's fear-mongering and racial dynamics. He's a good man. So if we can just talk to this guy and explain to him that now is the time to move, we can't wait any longer. But he's totally wrong. Yes, I mean, he is. I mean, at this point, inaction is the same as action. Lindbergh refusing to say anything is or, just Or this... flying all the way to Louisville to say nothing. Yes. Our country is at peace. Our people are at work. Our children are at school. I flew down here to remind each and every one of you of this. And now I'm going back to Washington so as to keep things that way. Thank you. Well, that was... Uh... <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Brief. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I confess it was. And that's all he has to say. Right. Although you hear a silence where you expect an applause moment because people are not quite ready for him to say only that. Were you ever tempted to explore this central but mysterious figure anymore, to give him more speeches, to show him leading a rally of some kind? Um, I think if you do, the book becomes upended. To the extent it becomes a referendum about Lindbergh, it becomes much less allegorical to what it means to individual Americans to confront a turn towards fascism. The moment you start making a referendum about who the totalitarian is, it becomes less about all totalitarians. It becomes more of a referendum on Charles A. Lindbergh. Let's join up with Alvin. If you haven't read the book, this is one of the major departures, Alvin's role in the denouement of the story. And could you talk about what was there and what you decided to change and why? Well, when I read the book the first time, it was as strong a journey into dialogue and character and family and all the things that make Rothian fiction what it is. Maybe even in some sense more so because he really was mining his family of origin as an act of memory and, and elegy. And I, I thought that stuff worked great. I think it's fair to say that Roth, for all his power, was never a writer who relied on or gave great weight to plotting. The plots were always just premises, and then he would work through them with character and dialogue. And so this is a book that is intensely plotted because he's imagining a different America, so the, the, the politics matter. And so he does it quite well. But when he's done, and when he gets to the end of the book and he's ready to have America return to the world of Franklin Roosevelt and to its own normative history, he does so with a very abrupt disappearance of Lindbergh into the clouds. It's a feeling of like waking up from a terrible dream. It's, right. It's just all over. I mean, I did feel a little disappointed or I felt it was a little abrupt when I read the book, but it sort of works in the sense of he set it up well by talking about the earlier crashes that Lindbergh had when he was an airmail pilot and talking about the early days of aviation and, you know, not everything was guaranteed and planes did disappear. And he sets it up as well as he could have. In a six-part miniseries, I'm not sure that you can take people on the same journey, particularly people an audience that is, has been raised on a world in which air travel is probably the safest form right. of travel, statistically. Uh, and I brought all these concerns to Roth when I met him. It's the one place when I went to meet him where I had an ask. He had a few asks, you know, changing the name of the family, don't make them orthodox, 
everyone's crazy talk about Lindbergh being alive and the kidnapped kid being alive and Germany has them, you know, that's all nonsense. Roth wrote that in as the stuff people say in terms of crazy conspiracy theories when somebody disappears, when there's a mystery without yeah. an answer. And he said this is sort of his version of conspiracy theory. And as he wrote it, he thought, well, no one's going to believe that the kidnapped child was raised in the Hitler youth. Yeah. And it's just, it's so off the wall. But incredibly, some of the critics who reviewed the book did think that. They thought that they were being given a plot developments right out of the mouths of Bengelsdorf and, and Evelyn. And um, he said, I just want to be clear with you that there's nothing there. Oh. It's nonsense. So I, I, that was, you know, there were two or three things I took from him. The one thing I asked for was, do you have any idea of how I might resolve this sudden and complete mystery that it seems like a Romana clay? And I think it'll stand out in a six-hour miniseries. And I sat across from this lion of American literature while he reread those three or four pages of the book. And then he went back and he did it again. Like he's looking at so the pages So he's sitting again. there. He's reading silently I'm, I'm his on, own on book. the other side of his coffee table. Yes. Leaning back in the couch, you know, starting to pucker. It felt like it was about an hour and a half. It was probably about four minutes. And finally, he closed the book and he looked at me and he said, well, it's your problem now. <laughs> and, which was I that took, a relief? It was. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it gave me permission to at least try. And the truth is I already had it in mind to do something with Alvin. Alvin's the only POV because of his war experience yeah. that might be caught up even at the unimportant fringes of an attempt to rebel, right. to resist, to assassinate a president. Alvin is, it turns out the men watching him weren't, at least not all of them, the FBI. There were other people, including somebody who he served with, who was on that mission with him in an earlier episode, who has been brought specifically to bring Alvin into this plot. Yeah. Harrison Riggs got shot trying to get you out of there. Harrison bought it. Riggs? Still shitting in a bag. You didn't know. I was, I was, I was out of my head. Yeah. You get the full sense of Alvin's failure. Which probably leverages his image to doing this. And these other somewhat mysterious men, some of whom are British, one of whom is an American who worked for FDR doing logistics, they have this piece of equipment that Alvin knows how to operate, and it is a kind of radar. And he's brought out to some place in the mountains of central Pennsylvania and told to use the equipment. Nothing happens. He doesn't find anything. But the strong assumption, the strong implication is somebody did. I think it's said, he says, this thing only has a range of 200 miles. And they said, your job is to man this post. Right. The guy he's dealing with basically makes clear, you might not be the only guy on the only mountaintop. Yeah. It was interesting to me. I mean, I understood what was going on, that in fact, you were bringing out something that could have been hinted at in the book, but wasn't made explicit at all, which was there really was a plot to bring down Lindbergh. It wasn't an accident. And we get a sense of who the plotters are. You put Alvin in the middle of it. He's the perspective. He's how we, we see need, it. Yeah, we need a POV. But you don't have him actually pull a trigger, figuratively or literally. He doesn't see the beep on the screen. I don't need to know exactly how the president has disappeared. I just need to know that Alvin is aware that yeah. the plane has not disappeared on its own. Right. That's sufficient for us to fix the hole in the mystery, I think, I hope. And my feeling is to have Alvin be mission critical would strain... Credulity. It, you know, in some ways, to have him be way on the periphery of what is happening is sufficient. That's all we need. I wanted to explore the very fundamental question of resistance and what is justified and what is not justified. When all democratic norms fail, and we watch them fail across episodes four and five, all the means of reform, all the means of redress that are supposedly there for us when they're gone, what are you entitled to? as a citizen, if the republic is no longer a republic. It goes back to Julius Caesar. Uh, that's probably the best classical text when it comes to an open debate about whether violence is permissible as an act of resistance and rebellion. But our country was founded on an act of fundamental challenge to authority and violence against a governing power. At what point does the semantics of calling something resistance or calling it terror cease to matter? Or does it always matter? I thought it was an interesting point to leave on. Another striking moment for me was when Alvin walks in after coming back from this adventure. Terrified. Plot, terrified. Terrified that he's actually been involved in this, even right. peripherally. Because he, he didn't know what he was doing. Now he knows Lindbergh's plane has disappeared. He knows. Or if he knew what he was doing, he hadn't done it yet. Yeah. There was that feeling of like, 
in theory, I'm trying to help take down the president's plane. And events are moving quite rapidly, and he walks in and he says, I'm my family. I'm asking, I'm my family. Uh, of course you are. <laughs> that I've been home for the last three days, sick, all right? Uh, minute, 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 you took care of me, right? If anybody asks, I've been home sick. I never left the damn place. It was a remarkable moment. What I especially love about that scene in the final edit is that it immediately follows Evelyn, who has not earned the loyalty of family, not done anything to earn it, yeah. coming back and asking for it where it has always been, asking her sister for help, basically asking for the same protections that Alvin's about to ask for, and she's turned away. Right. Bess! Bess! They're after me! I know they are! I have to hide. You have to hide me. You stupid girl. Bess, I'm, I'm in danger. I'm afraid. Don't you think that we're afraid too? Don't you think that we're in danger too? You. Selfish yeah. little bitch. We are all afraid. People are dead. Evelyn, people are dead. They're going to arrest me. They'll torture me, Bessie. Please! Go. You can't stay here. Go! Oh, please. How dare you? You go! Get out! That is an amazing scene. Bess is such a figure of real moral rectitude, that really is the moral center of this whole show. It almost seems as if you're giving that position the stamp of approval. Like, yes, there are things that are not forgivable to betray not just your own family, but people. She betrayed her own people. She advantaged herself without regard to the people who were being harmed. Now it's not about the lie of the brochure or about trying to take him to the Von Ribbentrop dinner. Now it's on the backs of people like Selma Wishnow and her orphan yeah. son. Selma Wishnow was dead because Evelyn sent her to Kentucky. Right. And at a certain point, family will not cover all. Yeah. Lindbergh is gone. All hell breaks loose. Vice President Burton K. Wheeler, a real-life person, becomes acting president. Martial law is declared. The border is closed. The conflagration finally reaches Bengelsdorf. He's no longer safe. He's arrested. Maybe that's the Rumkowski moment where finally right. they came for him in right. the end because no one else was left to come for. But then the day is saved by Ann Morrill Lindbergh. This is from the book. Mm -hmm. She is sort of thrown in Walter Reed by the conspirators and she gets out and she delivers an address to the nation. My countrymen, I ask that no further violence be visited upon Americans regardless of their race, religion, or national origin. I ask the Congress of the United States to initiate proceedings to remove from office the current acting president of the United States. Liberty and justice will be restored. And it works. A little bit of dignity. Yeah. Would it work? It goes, goes a long way. I don't know. I mean, there are moments of, it's one of those moments of, uh, of great oratory upon which, you know, worlds are supposed to change. I mean, that's the way he wrote it. The right speech at the right moment. I don't know what works anymore. And I don't know who has the moral gravitas to deliver a speech like that in our America, but it works in the book. You know, uh, the speech at Thermopylae, Mark Antony. I mean, you know, it's... it's I was a, about to say Lincoln's second inaugural didn't help him much. No, yeah. no, no. A lot of good uh, speechifying actually is on the wrong side of history. So it's too much to say all is restored. A lot of damage has been done. There's a lot of broken glass to be cleaned up. But things return to something approaching calm. Except in the Levin house, Alvin and Herman have a tremendous fight, a physical altercation, which is terrifying and scary. Do you have any idea what's happening to the Jews in this country? What's at stake now in this coming election? The Jews? I wrecked my life for the Jews. I lost my fucking leg for the Jews. I lost my fucking leg for you. All you talk about Lindbergh and about how goddamn awful he was, but did you ever do anything about it? Ah, did you ever get off your ass and fight? Or were you just going to sit there by the fucking radio complaining for the rest of eternity? And you're going to talk to me about the Jews? 
You? If Lindbergh was still <laughs> here. <laughs> but he's not, is he? Thank God. Is that what you think? That the Jewish God, huh? Uh, Yahweh himself waits until the time is right to put a plague on Pharaoh, a part to see, so you can sit on your ass and wait for you God. You think it's easy to speak out against a Lindbergh? Do you think it doesn't cost? To speak? When the fuck do you people ever act? Huh? When it's too late. When the damage is already done. All you people ever do is talk. Elvin! Vernon! <laughs> Vernon, stop! Elvin! The circumstances are somewhat different in the book because, as we've discussed, Alvin at this point is irretrievably gone in terms of like being a moral or decent person. That's not the case here. But you felt it was important to keep this fight, to keep this I thought conflict. it did even better service for us. Why? Well, first of all, they're both right and they're both wrong. So now it's a much more interesting fight. Alvin comes in hot and obnoxious. Yeah. And, and He's got his flashy new car. He's full of himself. Wife. Yeah, full of himself. And that irritates Herman. But Herman comes back on him and says, do you care about anything other than yourself? And he's basically talking to a guy who did give his leg for the cause for which Herman claimed so much fealty. And then what we also know that he can't tell Herman is that when called upon again to do something even more extraordinary and with greater personal risk, he answered that call. We now have a different person facing off for that fight who is confronted by the anger of a longtime antagonist, his uncle, who doesn't represent him fairly in his criticism. Meanwhile, we know that Herman has gone through hell and high water to rescue Selden. And that could only happen after the disappearance of Lindbergh, right. you know, plot-wise, and it could only happen after the rescue of Selden. They both bring their heroism, unspoken to the other, to the table, and they mm -hmm. both carry that on their shoulders. And so the fight becomes far more tragic. It's true, because in the book, it's inevitable. But here, it almost feel like it could have been avoided. Right. Like, it, it, they actually almost agreed. You can imagine that if Bess had sat across from Alvin and told him of the journey to get Selden. And Mira had sat across from, if she even knows, I don't yeah. know if she, but it had sat across from Herman and right. told him, you know, what the nephew had been involved in at great risk for the sake of ending a totalitarian threat. You get the impression that it could have ended in an embrace and an apology, yeah. but nobody knows anything. All Herman sees of Alvin is these guys getting fat and getting crooked and getting full of himself. And when the nation has been through so much right. to reveal what's really important. And Alvin, all he knows of the uncle is he yells at the radio. So the, the, it, it somehow felt incredibly resonant and tragic. In order to preserve the nuclear family of the Levins, they've had to jettison Evelyn and they have to jettison Alvin. Everybody's home, peacefully or not. The fight has happened and we arrive at the end. Again, in the book, as we have said, it's all over. It's like a bad dream. And Philip Roth, writing from the perspective of being an adult, describes history then taking its course in the way that it did in real life. Pearl Harbor is bombed. FDR is restored to the presidency. We enter the war. We win it, etc. You made a very different choice. We don't find out who won the election. And there's a sign that the election itself is being rigged. It may be enough to corrupt the election, or maybe not. Yeah. But we know that they're engaged in things beyond just counting the votes. Right. Herman leans into the radio to hear the first election results cut to black. Well, not quite to black. We cut to the radio dial as it turns slowly from yellow to orange. What did you want the audience to take away from that ending? I wanted the audience to walk into an election year in America. Maybe the most important election year in quite a long time. And I wanted them to remember this miniseries when they go into the voting booth. To me, just as an audience member, you were rejecting the message of the book, or at least the end of the book, in which everything eventually returned to normal. And this strange eruption of madness into history passed away and everything took its mm -hmm. normal course. And it seems to me like what you're saying is you can't count on that. That to just assume that this will all be over, whatever it may be, is foolish. They're in a fight for their lives in 1940. Uh, they're in a fight to restore American ideals. That's where we left it. That's what Election Day is in 1942, after Lindbergh disappears, but the movement Lindbergh set in motion is still thoroughly engaged. And we are in a fight. And I very much wanted that moment to come home. The guy I should credit with arguing for this ending and arguing that we not play out the restoration of Roosevelt in the last election, as in the book, it's Kerry Antholis, and uh, Kerry Antholis in my career is kind of seminal. 
He was an executive at HBO. He just retired last year. I met him in 1998 when he read The Corner, my second book, and came to Baltimore to talk to me about making it into a, a miniseries. This was his last project with me. He's the one who said, if we land this thing in an election year, you should go out on them waiting for the first results. Huh. And when he first said it, I was like, uh, and all, I needed about an hour before I realized he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. What it's saying is, this is us. This is us then, this is us now. Again, democracy is so hard and it demands so much of us every day. And whether we know it or not, we're always on tender hooks. We're always at the edge of a precipice. And the moment we stop believing otherwise is the moment it really gets dangerous. One way of looking at this entire miniseries is it's an examination of modes of resistance, right? Represented by different characters at different times. For example, confrontation, fighting, acceptance, collaboration, avoidance, exile, fleeing. Various characters do various iterations of those things throughout. Did you come to any conclusion as to what the best response to this kind of authoritarianism, erosion of freedom, is? And more to the point, do you know what you would choose to do, given the same circumstances? I know the minimum. The minimum is you have to vote, and you have to vote not just for your own self-interest, you have to vote for the collective. You have to vote for the idea that we share a collective governance and a collective space as Americans. And if that's threatened, if the idea of any of us are going to be delivered to something less than citizenship or less than human dignity, then you have to vote as if that's the only issue that matters. Mm. I don't care whether you're Democratic or Republican. There are standards of behavior that the Republic itself can't endure. We won't survive if these norms are not upheld. And so you have to vote. And then the other thing that's required is that you have to speak openly. You have to at least dissent to the point of opening up your throat and calling right, right, and calling wrong, wrong. That's the basic minimum. We've reached the end, both of the series, The Plot Against America, and this podcast. It has been an extraordinary privilege and honor uh, and something of an adventure to go over this remarkable piece of work with you, David. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Sagal. If you miss me, because you can't hear me talk about this anymore, I do fart jokes on public radio. Tune in to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me on NPR. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our team at Pineapple Street Studios includes executive producers Jenna Weiss Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. This episode's lead producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our associate producer is Alexis Moore, post production and mixing by Elliot Adler, and our editor is Maddie Sprung Kaiser. This podcast will remain available as well as the miniseries itself. You can find this podcast, review, and rate it via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the HBO apps, or anywhere in the cloud you might find your podcasts. Thank you all so much, both for your attention to the miniseries and to this podcast. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and we'll see you next time.